Like the excitement we felt when we started the Clean Kilo supermarket, we're like, you know, we could like reduce like look, all this packaging and talk to all these local people and create something really unique. And and I guess that's what what Kilo Zero was because we wanted to again do what we did, but in the hospitality industry. So. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Breaking Bread. This is the food podcast presented by Food Obsessed mates Liam and Carl. I'm Liam. I'm Carl Watcher. Watcher. Not Carl Watcher. That's not my name. That's not his surname, no. Oh, Carl McCaffrey. I should have left a bit of a uh, gap. We never say our surnames. I'm conscious of that. You know, when I listen to podcasts, they always, they always say the second name. So people like, just think it's an Irish podcast. <laughs> this is the Birmingham Irish podcast. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> and I, I could hear, like, after I say my surname, but everyone going, what? <laughs> yeah, what was that noise? I normally just spell it. <laughs> when they say, oh, what's your surname? I just say, hey, Che, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. don't even say it, I just spell it. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, wicked, wicked. Podcasting season, we're doing well. We're flying now. We're They're coming in thick and fast. We are. Been eating? Obviously, you have to eat. Every day. <laughs> every day. Every day I've been eating, yeah. <laughs> have you been eat, eating out? I have. We've been eating out. Yeah. I went to our favourite the other day, Bonehead. Oh, mate. That place only gets, I say it all the time, it still only gets better and better and better. That was like a dream kind of evening. That was like, you know, recording that, we recorded a podcast first at the top of a rally in the private dining room. Yeah. And I, that was overlooking a great podcast. Birmingham. Yeah, and that was wicked. You'll hear that in a few weeks. And then uh, racing out there then to get down to Burnett. Yeah, in time before it closed. Got there oh. just in time. Oh, I'm just, oh man. I do, I, if you haven't been, then I generally can't help you. No. It's, for my money, the best restaurant in Burnett. I say this all the time. I can't mention Burnett without saying it's the best restaurant. I'd be surprised if there's anyone listening to this who doesn't know what Burnett is. Like, yeah. Surely everyone's yeah. been to Burnett now. But if you've been putting it off thinking, it can't be that good, I'll just go. It's only chicken. No, it's not. Just go. And they've got yeah. a special thing today. If this comes out Monday. Yeah, today, yeah. Good they've got thinking, a Thai-fried yeah. chicken special on. Was it, with lap. was it bookings? I can't remember if it was bookings. I don't know if it's sold out, but... No, I don't think it was. I think you just turn up. I think you just turn up. So if you can, get up there tonight because that is good. Laps food, it's unbelievable. But anyway, Thai fried chicken, what's not to love? I know, man. Sounds amazing. And you know it's going to be good there. I'll tell you what was called cool, the uh, UCB evening. Yeah, I was really chuffed to get an invite to that. What was it called? The Food Revolution or something? They're just yeah, creative stories. A series of events and each one's got a theme and this was sustainability. And they invite, and it's all cooked by all the students at UCB, and mm. it's, it's all put on by them. And there's interesting speakers, and it's loads of people. Great chance for networking. It was a great event, wasn't it? I thought it was fantastic. I just thought it was good that they filled the room with different people as well. It wasn't just intellectuals. It wasn't just like uh, university students. It wasn't just counselors. It was people from. There was just normal people like me and you, a couple of um, food bloggers and stuff that were there, and then. It just kind of broadened the conversation because, you know, a lot of time it's an echo chamber and everyone's yeah. sitting there all in agreement. But if you can spread the conversation further by getting a different array of people in, it's just brilliant. Like, mate, how good was Professor George Yao? Oh, from Cambridge. You see this person, you can see why people flock to Cambridge and Oxford University. Cause we had this professor from Cambridge and he was the most engaging person I've ever seen talk. I think he's obviously done a lot of like public speaking because he was fantastic and the whole room was in silence just completely engaged he was up and around didn't stay in one place every word he said was fantastic i'm not being funny if i had teachers like that at school i'd still be in school now <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> incredible person yeah so just if you get the ch- if you get an invite off Br- bradley wasn't it they invited us he's leading all of that if you can get down there and have a go at that have a listen just it's it's important it's very important I was on the King's Eve Market as well. We were down there. Yeah, Massive that was shout out brilliant. to Pips, our friend Pip, Pip, Pip's Hot Sauce fame, organising that wicked market down King's Eve. They had their first one. Me and you bumped into each other, completely unplanned, which was funny. Yeah, we didn't, it's just the stars aligned. We're just meant to keep bumping into each other over and over again, I think. It was mega busy and uh, there was some awesome stores and most of the food ones are sold out real fast. 
But yeah, that, I wanted to get some cake from Lil's Parliament. Yeah, or some Sam. cookies or something. I'd, I'd only got there like an hour after it opened. She'd sold out. Yeah, That's Sam how popular was, that is. That's how good her stuff is. I was gutted. I was like, ah, oh, man. The next one is next Sunday. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Easter Sunday, yeah. The second Sunday of every month, I think. Yeah, second Sunday of every month. So make sure you get down to there. It was great. I picked up a Mother's Day gift, picked up, you know, Pumpkin Chances were there. So yeah. that's always good. Nave loved it as well. Nave got some little crafty bits as well. It was nice. And then I went to Paws, but you were already at Paws. <laughs> and I, I, went, I went to go to somewhere and it was too full. I won't say where. And then we went to Paws just to grab a coffee on the way back to the car. And then you came walking in again. You got the last <laughs> slice of coffee cake, mate. I was oh, devastated. mate, that coffee cake at Paws is unbelievable. I went a few weeks ago and got a, a nice little latte and a, a coffee slice of that cake, mate. It's the best cake I've ever had. I mean, I'm not massive on cake, but that was phenomenal. Oh, mate, it was incredible. Absolutely. Bar is an absolute genius with bacon. It's just not too sweet. There was like a real savouriness yeah, to it. Yeah, that's what I like I about coffee it. cake. It's not yeah. as easy. Like, that's why I like carrot cake as well. I like the further cakes that aren't too sweet. But yeah, best cake I've ever had. So that was awesome. So if you get a chance, get down to that. Uh, get on today's episode because it's it's not long. There's a, It's heavy though. There's a lot into it. It's important stuff, man. Uh, yeah, it's a good one, man. We're talking to Tom and Jeanette from The Clean Kilo. Yeah, we talk about their shop, their cocktail bar. The bar's called Kilo Zero. And that's... It's really, we recorded in there. It was really nice inside. It's lovely in there, yeah. I can't believe we haven't been in fairness. And the cocktails are all like sustainable and made right. with like other products. Like it sounds Broccoli. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound amazing. Yeah, no, that doesn't sound amazing. <laughs> people liked it. Out. She said it was popular. So just but, really yeah. two interesting people just really smashing it. Like, I mean, you, you don't need us to tell us, tell you about how important it is to use less plastic and sustainability and how important that is. Like, yeah, of course. And these two are just, they were the first to do it in Birmingham. I think there was other places around, I don't even know if the UK, they might have been the first in the UK, I'm not sure, but I think they said in the podcast, but you'll hear that. Yeah, um, we don't want to ruin it, you'll hear all this. No, it you'll hear. A good podcast, man, it's really interesting. It's talking about, we do delve in a bit about the troubles Dig Buff is having at the moment yeah, with yeah, the yeah. roadworks that don't seem to ever end, no. or don't seem to ever have anyone working on it either, no. to be honest, because every time we go past, there's... Lots of barriers and no people. I think that's that's the story of the clean kilo so far. They've had just a lot of barriers, you know, and despite all of that, they've come through it. Obviously, since we recorded, sadly, Mosley's closed down, which is a bit of gutting for them, for us, for everyone, really. Yeah. But Bourneville's still going. And the bar's still going. And the bar's still going. It's a no. Seriously, hit the bar. If you're in Dig Buff, like, yeah. I think that they get overlooked quite a lot when mm. people go out in Dig Buff, and they really shouldn't because everything there is fantastic. We even talk about get some tips for other hospitality businesses, how they can become a bit more sustainable. Yeah, and if you're looking at setting up a business, like yeah. they go into detail about how you go about doing it. Like it's, if you're setting up a business, this podcast is perfect. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Tom and Jeanette. Yeah, welcome to Breaking Bread. Thanks very much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. How are you doing? Yeah, good. good. Very good. Enjoy. Tired as always. Tired as always. Yeah. I, I, I always come because we always do this on a Monday and I always say, <laughs> nice day off. And I'm like, and then I think that they don't have days off. <laughs> <laughs> They're not like us where we have nice weekends off. Like. Oh, that'd be yeah, the, that'd I don't be remember great. last time we had a full weekend. It's it? overrated if that makes mm. you feel better. Oh, well, really? that's the thing. Like, you've always got that Sunday blues if you, if you have a weekend. Whereas if you work every day, that's one positive. You don't. You yeah. don't have the Sunday blues, you just have it every day. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's a good thing. No, mate. Uh, <laughs> when I was on the railway, there were people there, they wouldn't go on holiday. And you'd be like, why don't you go on holiday? You're like, because I've just got to come back to work. Yeah, yeah. So like, they didn't even take annual leave or anything. They never went anywhere because they said they didn't like the feeling of having to go back to work. Mm. <laughs> so how's your January been? January's been okay, actually. Um, obviously, it's our first January as Kilo Zero in hospitality. So we was kind of... Didn't know what to expect because it's obviously naturally supposed to be the, the quietest month. But I guess because we've changed our business model quite a bit through adapting, through what's happening. Uh, we do a lot of private events at the moment and corporates and stuff. So it was actually an okay January. Yeah. Not too bad. I think yeah. also because we're still building up our baseline, mm. like it's still on the up, whereas everyone else will have a 
generally a baseline that they know about and then it'll drop off in January. For us, we're still building up. So I think for that reason, even when we didn't have events, there was still um, good good footfall. Yeah, because it's a nice spot and it's really you've done a great job in the bar. It looks fantastic. Thank you. I, I designed the bar myself. Well, you did it yourself? Yeah, so um, I ended up designing and Tom did a lot of the carpentry. So it's so very much like in here for like, was it two and a half months straight? Yeah. Wow. While also opening up for, uh, Mosley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a long story, isn't it? So we should probably start at the start. Start at the start, yeah. Yeah, yeah by all means. Start, start, the start, start, start where you start. That's the main. Um, you might as well go from there because you were a shop originally. Yeah, so um, so the Clean Kilo, that's where it all began. Um, 2017, this was like a time before like plastic pollution was really like in the mainstream media. I remember when like we watched a documentary called Plastic Ocean on Netflix. It was seeing that documentary made us realize that this is a massive issue, but it was just really strange at the time that it wasn't talked about. I remember like a few months later, we saw it on like the 10 o'clock news. Oh, oh, they're talking about the plastic pollution. And it was like the first time. Um, But yeah, that's where the Clean Kilo concept came from. You were looking to do, you come back from Australia. Yeah, in Australia. I was there for four years. I did my PhD there. You're originally from Birmingham? Yeah, from Litchfield. Yeah. Um, So it's kind of, yeah. Great. I call everything Greater Birmingham. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Just annoy everyone and call every Sully Hall, Litchfield, Warsaw. I don't, it's all Greater Birmingham. Greater Birmingham. West Brom, don't care. It's Greater Birmingham. Um, yeah, so came back from Australia. We, I'd seen this concept there um, in a sort of slightly different form. Um, it was like a scoop type place. Um, but things have moved on since then quite a bit. The technology had got slightly improved um, mm. and... Jeanette, we, we discussed it, and Jeanette had seen these, like this idea in her mind of at a hotel, you know, when you get the, the cereal dispensers at hotels, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that, but with lots of them um, for everything. So, now, when you say scoop, I think of the, do you remember the old scooper shops? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people talk to us about those. And, yeah, like, they kind of got like negative like connotations because yeah, every yeah. grubby little kid you have yeah. mix in the sweet ones like yeah. It? yeah yeah so luckily the yeah the design has definitely moved on since then and um yeah i think there was those you know this cereal dispenser that i imagined in like hotels turns out there was something designed like that for um selling bulk basically so yeah the clean killer started with a, with a lot of research and just some crazy idea to provide a shop in Birmingham where you could have lots of product under one roof because we found ourselves going to multiple places all the time to try and find things loose or buy things in bulk which obviously when you're busy it's not like time efficient so I think people this day and age want things under one roof which is why a supermarket is obviously successful so we try to build a zero waste supermarket by sourcing all the um, elements of like what you need day to day to put into the clean kilo looking back now it does seem like it was a crazy idea even back then and people mm. thought we were a little bit strange um to... did you approach anyone for funding or anything or how did you start it? yeah so um it was the actual so we're in the bar now we're sat in the original the clean kilo dig booth and um, this is where we open in 2018 but the, as you can see behind us the mural up there actually is our crowdfunding mural Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we didn't have enough money to start this ourselves, so um, we went for crowdfunding. Had you already approached people and they'd laughed you out of it? No, to be fair, like, we didn't even think to approach anyone. We didn't think any, we knew anyone that would find us, like, normal enough to, to be like... Because at the time, Zero Way Shops, like, wasn't prominent in mm-hmm. the UK, and we are like, oh, yeah, we want to open up a shop where customers have to bring their own containers, and even... Some of our friends and family were like, don't know if this is going to work. That's a big ask. Um, we did um, We did go on the, I don't know if you heard of the Be Seen program, which mm-hmm. is like, um, it's run by like three Birmingham universities. I think it's BCU, Aston and one other. Um, and they run like a course on how to start up a business. Um, and they give you a small amount of funding. I think it was a thousand pounds, something like that. Um, to help you and also like teach you about marketing sales that kind of stuff Um, so there was that and there was also another organization called unlimited 
yeah. um, that we applied for a small amount of yeah of so these weren't well. like investors as such there were people that like are interested in maybe social enterprises and things like that mm. and yeah we just started like telling people what the idea was obviously to create this space um, as a zero-waste supermarket. And the, that term zero-waste shop already existed across like the world, like in the um, mainly America, Australia, mm. Europe, the term zero-waste shops were being used. So they did have like gravity dispensers in and a scale system where a customer would bring their own container. Um, they would weigh the container that they bought from home and that would then tear the weight off so they don't get charged for obviously bringing the container. Then they would fill it with the product and it would just work out what the content is. So, um, and we were quite surprised that there wasn't anything at the time in the UK. And then I think like as we were crowdfunding, um, the first one did open in, in Totnes in Devon. So it was good timing to go down and check it out as well. So yeah, I feel like we were just at that cusp where like things were changing and people were starting to find out. Um, the crowdfunding was a success, so we I think the actual figure we were aiming for was like fifteen thousand, but we managed to raise over twenty thousand. Wow. And um, yeah, so it, yeah, it kind of all snowballed because obviously we're just these like two people that had a concept, and like even now when I think back on it, it seems weird to have the energy to do yeah. all that crowdfunding because it, it was a big <laughs> job. It was like a full-time job. Um, but saying that, I actually did have a full-time job. So I was doing it in the evening. So Tom was doing it full-time. But I, I used to be a menswear designer, which is obviously completely different. Yeah. Um, so I felt like I was doing something completely different in the daytime and then obviously trying to do the clean kilo at night. Um, so, yeah, it was like, I think we did the, the research took us, the research and the crowdfunding took about a year. And by the time we kind of like a lot of people knew what was happening, we had a lot of support in Birmingham um, for the Zero Waste Shop. Uh, a lot of people wanted it, as you know, like 500 people donated. So that just shows in itself that it was a popular concept. And uh, we did things like market research, even on like the streets. I think King Seaf was one of the streets we were looking at at first before we came to Digbeth to ask people what they thought of the concept. And most people were quite open to bringing their own containers. So, yeah, it was like a kind of um, a time of like change where people started to have awareness. I think Blue Planet was like the big thing, wasn't it? Yeah. So it was about halfway through. or Was it just the beginning? Just the was- beginning of, the, of when we released the crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. That Sunday, uh, the David Attenborough Blue Planet 2 was on like aired on the TV. So that meant that bl- plastic pollution in the ocean was becoming like really well known and I it think it was that- shocking though wasn't it I remember watching it thinking yeah. holy yeah, shit yeah and it's so weird to think that was the first time yeah. most people have found I mean, out about it it not even that it. long ago and it's clearly been going on for a very long time <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah as long as plastics <laughs> existed like 1930s or before so so that really yeah. boosted our campaign quite significantly yeah um, and that was just pure luck you know we had no idea that the show was going to be aired so yeah like we managed to find obviously this spot we, we considered other like suburbs but Digbeth um, seemed like a good place to start because because the concept obviously was a bit unknown to a lot of people. We wanted we didn't a suburb to start with might not have been a good idea because people wouldn't really understand it. Whereas when you're kind of city centre based, at least people could travel in by public transport mm. from all areas of um, Birmingham, and we and we did find that when we first opened, like. Um, People from like Derby and um, kind of like Nottingham Nottingham would be coming here to do like some bulk shopping. They'd come like, you know, once a month and spend a lot and then go back. So it wasn't like frequent trips, if you know what I mean. But they were, it was a big amount of our footfall was from from that kind of stuff. Digbeth kind of feels like a suburb, but like not far from the city centre in itself, you know? Yeah, Yeah. definitely. It definitely feels like its own place, doesn't it? Yeah, and there's so many like, creative businesses and it's like small businesses it felt like a really good place um and it has been it's been it has been really supportive i'd say like in terms of like um like the management for our uh, building and stuff they've been really good and they like picking small businesses as well um obviously digworth has his own issues which we'll we'll get sure we'll get (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah no it was definitely um a great place to start and like you know it's it's a lovely building as well what state was the building in because it's it's building you drive past all the time and don't take much notice of and mm. then you think you stop and look at it one day and go wow what a building like it's yeah stunning. yeah i it, think the inside is is pretty good i think the yeah. outside could do with what was it before before you guys had it 
I know. What was it originally? Library. Very originally, it was bank. Bank. So it was, yeah. it was Lloyd's. I feel like everything was a bank at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's cool actually. It's got an original bank vault in there, and and oh, yeah. the thick walls, like. Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's like fifty yeah. centimeters. Yeah, the walls were. That's about where the half wine is. Thick. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it secure. Um, <laughs> and there's some of the windows say like bank. It's all etched into the window. Yeah. So the original. Even windows all these bars stuff. are because of the bank. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, makes sense. But what was it then before you came? Uh, it was a salon. It was salon. Really random. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I think, Bank, <laughs> salon, shop, I think before bar. that it was it was a, a violin shop and like That's quite a popular one, wasn't it? Yeah, like we, occasionally we still get people coming in saying, Oh, right. what, what really you're... old people <laughs> that haven't followed social media. Looking for a violin. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like five things since that, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you have to do much work to the place or? It was an it was a, a white shell like yeah. ready to go for the shop. Oh, that's um, how that um so it was really like, yeah, it was it was in a good state and yeah. didn't have to do a lot really. It was, no. it was good. It was just kind of figuring out like I think it was the sourcing of equipment to make it into a zero waste shop that at the time was difficult. Like these days it wouldn't be because there are so many zero waste yeah. shops. There's people that sell these scales and dispensers and lots of suppliers that do bulk um and lots of suppliers that do circular, so that's when you give back the container and they refill it. Um, but yeah, when we first started sourcing, it was a complete minefield. Like there wasn't like anything. We really had to. Well, we were looking at like some German company for the dispensers because there wasn't anything in the UK at one point. And mm. yeah, it was really just at, at the start of things. Um, but yeah, like we somehow managed to to get everything. Um, we wanted so basically in terms of food there was like loose goods like cereals nuts um chocolate snacks legumes beans pasta and um, rice and then there's all like the, the baking goods like um flowers and then we dried wanted fruit dried stuff. fruit and um, we wanted to have loose fruit and veg and um, an element of like interactiveness as well because i think like so many people going online these days you want to bring people to the premises to be able to experience shopping and obviously shopping independent is one thing but we wanted to have some like machines in there so we we had some like orange juicer machine a coffee grinder and now we've got an oat milk machine as well and just to make it more fun and even the process of weighing your containers and stuff um we find that a lot of families come in and like the kids like (laughs) really enjoy doing it um and uh, what else we have we've got liquid items cleaning as well products. We've um, got, so yeah there's there's one particular couple of companies that do cleaning products and they do them in 20 liter containers that we send back and they're, they're set up for that they have like that circular system that they've pretty much created in the period of time since we've been open some of those um so it's, it shows that it's like a, a growing yeah well, i was gonna say um, the stuff you get does that come in plastic um it depends there are some things so like with the bulk, the about I would say percentage wise, seventy percent will be common in paper, like a bulk sack of paper. Yeah. Twenty five kilos. But there will be maybe twenty percent that will come in a plastic liner. And obviously people might think, Oh, you've got plastic well But you're stuck na- in loads. Naturally more there's going to be that. some things require plastic, like dried yeah. fruit and stuff because they store it for X amount of days and whatnot. But the idea is that when you have lots of little packets going into lots of different households, you have absolutely no control mm. of how those packets are getting um, disposed of. They could be going into a landfill bin, bins overflow. That's when they escape, obviously, into canals and oceans. Whereas, obviously, our liner, we have First Mail, which is a company that takes flexible plastics and then it gets downcycled into li- bin liners and things like that so then we have control over it yeah um and obviously it reduces proportionally the um lots of the weight of lots of little packets as having a, a singular liner and then um i say the other kind of 15 20 percent is circular so circular is that we would have um a container so for instance our crisps they come in a 1.5 liter bucket and the oil from the same people come in a 20 litre drum. Um, that's all locally sourced from um, Staffordshire. So we even know like the farmer by name and stuff. And it was the first time they had ever been asked when we first opened, like, can you provide these crisps for us like loose? 
and they're like, Ooh. not really. Like, no, they, they go into packets. Like our whole system is set up for them to go into packets. But obviously, crisp packets, mixed material, like. I would say hard to recycle if recycled at all in, in most councils. Um, and, you know, because they're a small company, they were they were like, mm, this is interesting. Okay, well, maybe we can change the way we do things. With with them as well, like the farmer like said, right, I'll, I'll buy a 10 litre bucket. I'll put this, these crisps in and I'll keep eating them over the course of a period of months and see how they, see if they become less fresh yeah and just always put the lid back on taste them every day and he, he was like well six months later they're still fine so mm. yeah we'll we'll sell them to you kind of yeah, thing you cut I'd, them I'd, a little I'd bit thicker as well yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a good test it was a good job yeah 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 so he cut them a little bit thicker as well yeah. for us. so it, it's really great obviously being able to work with small independents um to make these changes happen and and that was just kind of like one story but it it became our best story because from having that conversation back in 2018, this like crazy conversation about not having crisps in packets, um, he's now selling to um, about 500 zero waste shops in the country wow. and teamed up with the person we mentioned earlier about with the cleaning products that has a circular uh, system. So they go around the country anyway, um, taking up the drums for the cleaning products and then now they've obviously taken on the food side of things so they're doing the crisps and the oils as well so imagine like you know how many 25 gram bags are in a 1.5 kg bucket and then that's one shop that's one bucket but now that's is multiplied into 500 zero waste shops so obviously like you know people sometimes think oh you know you're not making a difference because you're just one person or whatnot but actually like from that conversation that made a huge difference um and yeah, we'd like to think that would be like millions of crisp packets saved. Um, so yeah, and that that kind of thing, like when we we're doing the sourcing, we started talking to a lot of different people, like even um, like Quarter Horse, was, I'm sure you may have yeah, met him or yeah. interviewed him before, um, you know, about returnable buckets for the beans. Mm. And so we do that with Quarter Horse now, but we do that with 100 House as well. I don't know if you met those guys. Not um, met them, but had their coffee yeah, yeah amazing coffee yeah. both of them um they both come in returnable buckets and it was a system that like, wasn't available before but now they've they've set it up and mm. we were obviously one of the first customers um which are the ones there was obviously morley milk so there was milk buckets in returnable containers from a small dairy farm even like all the bakery items now like even when we have new bakery like from the ground bakery we've just uh, started in in Digbeth now and we just asked her can can they come in a container instead of like in lots of separate packets and that's fine obviously the tricky thing is we've got all these containers assigned to these local people and it's keeping a track of it (laughs) and giving it back and letting the team know oh this one's this person this one's this person this one's this person because then suddenly if you don't train properly you're going to have this build-up of containers and they all seem to use the same container as well it's like, please just you get yeah. green buckets and you have white buckets yeah. that'd be great yeah. there's a lot of post-it notes yeah. yeah so that that is a difficulty and i think i don't know if it's the concept like the, the concept now but a lot of people back in the day was like oh if it's a zero waste shop it must mean that it's cheaper because they're not buying in in packaging but there's a yes and no to that because some things buying in bulk works out cheaper so we sell it cheaper so that means we're cheaper than the supermarket and I always use the example of herbs and spices I did like a post um literally yesterday um and it was like significantly cheaper and to I've come to us did you see it yeah yeah, yeah, it. yeah and it was kind of, I was kind of shocked by it as well because every so often we just like rework it out again we're like oh gosh wow um but then there are some things that are going to be more expensive so if we're getting I don't know some kind of organic product um that's less frequent in in the supermarket and it's the it's the extra labor as well because when you're buying in bulk or circular you're committing then to obviously filling that dispenser labeling that dispenser doing all the kind of admin to make sure the traceability is okay for that product and then a customer's coming in and you've got a member of staff who's then letting a customer know about how to use the dispenser and the scales and then um obviously assisting with that and then obviously the dispenser then needs filling up so then you're scooping into the dispenser and then eventually when that's gone, you're then washing the dispenser. So it's it's so much more logistics than um, a supermarket where you've 
I don't know, I can imagine you open up a box, packets go out, shelf, it's already got the label on, it's got everything on. You just, you, you're forcing the customer to buy a certain amount as well. So like there's more profitability in that because it's more profitable because um, instead of selling like, um, I don't know, one loose apple, you're selling a, a bag of eight apples that the customer obviously has to buy eight apples even if they don't need eight apples. And then the person behind the till gets to make a margin on selling eight apples rather than selling someone one apple. So obviously... We all know weighing, like, if you need one red pepper... It's always more expensive. Yeah, you're going to buy the pack of three, aren't you? Oh, yeah. yeah, Just buy the pack of three. 20p more and I get two more peppers. Yeah, Yeah, I'll just just do that. Yeah, Yeah. and and that's the sad thing about it is the the fact that um, some items will cost more because of logistics but if you're like kind of savvy and doing things um you know to save money you look for the items obviously that aren't and there are a lot of like kind of DIY items as well like kind of like natural cleaning products like citric acid and things like that that's loads cheaper than obviously buying uh, cleaning products from a supermarket as well so um, So that's um, interesting because that post caught my eye because I've I think a lot of people will probably feel the same. They would assume everything's more expensive. Mm. Yeah. Because you feel like, oh, it's more premium. And when, sometimes when you do add labels like sustainable or environmental friendly, it's a premium no, price. It's like adding organic comes. on the label. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cost, yeah. Yeah. But that's interesting one. to find out um, yeah. a lot of things don't cost more. And they, in yeah. fact, a lot of things cost less. We yeah. kind of say that from our kind of comparisons, we're cheaper than or similar to the brand price. Yeah. There's no way we're going to compete with like the value version at the supermarket, like 19p noodles or something like that. No. It's 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 going to be a bit more expensive, but we we're never more than a brand like product. Like high street of, brand. Yeah. yeah. Um, I keep trying to tell people though, it's like used won't be too expensive. It's that the supermarkets are selling it too cheap. Yeah, yeah there's We've that. We've all got used to this. Really, <laughs> like everything yeah. has to be cheap. It's a race to the bottom. Definitely. If something's too cheap you should look at it and say, why is it so cheap? Like, why is that piece of beef so yeah. cheap? Like, mm. yeah. that's a cow that's probably cost hundreds of pounds to look after for a few years. Like, yeah. it should never cost that little money. Yeah, know? definitely. I mean, when we buy bananas, they're like a fair trade banana that's Del Monte, and they're more expensive for us to buy than they are at the supermarket off the shelf. <laughs> oh, that yeah. kind of shows, like, where, yeah. where the price kind of balances, and it seems... Quite yeah, long. there's something strange about supermarket prices. Even your mum always says, like, it used to be cheaper for... No, it used to be more expensive for me, like, 10 years ago than it is now. So you're like, yeah, mm, that's what a, are they doing? Like, strange, isn't wrong, it? Yeah, <laughs> very wrong. Something dodgy, isn't it? Yeah. Do you ever get criticism for, like, selling stuff like bananas? You know, like, the air miles that come with it and... Yeah, it's actually something that we've always considered. So we really limit um, the fruit and veg that have a lot of air miles. Mm-hmm. Kind of like are kind of one that we debate in always is kind of like bananas and avocados because I guess like for us because we're so consciously aware of um where seasonality of the food is coming from we know that gosh obviously that banana's never gonna be low harbour miles and, and neither is that avocado um but then do we have a good alternative for it in the UK no so that's kind of our baseline if we won't buy a New Zealand apple. In fact, probably a lot of people that go into supermarkets all year round don't even realise them apples are coming from New Zealand. They'll, it's just an apple. But obviously, we have consciousness on that. So that's one of our like things. Like you know, if it can be grown in the UK, we don't we don't buy it in. Yeah. Um, when, when apples go out of season, you can only get them from France or Spain. We, mm. That's when we we will yeah. stop for a little while. Yeah, like yeah. At it's first, not a long yeah, period. Really. The furthest will go with like maybe European. But like in terms of like ridiculousness, like we just we just Mange cut off two our own. from like Kenya, <laughs> yeah. Or... yeah. And that's I guess that's like something that we do that we don't really talk about a lot, but like we we are obviously like are very aware. Um, but then obviously not having some things in your ra- your range, having no lemons, um, barely not many oranges, having no bananas. So commonplace in in we'll, kitchens. We'll yeah. put people off coming to. Mm your shop altogether and obviously the idea of so that's where at the start was trying to make loose um accessible. items more accessible um and appealing as well so if you then take away everything that like 
people might need on a day to day. Because let's face it, not I don't think many households would cut out fruit and vegetables that are shipped from abroad in realisticness. So it's a balance. It's getting that balance of there is no perfection in, in zero waste. In fact, the term zero waste is actually um, quite misleading in the way that a lot of people will take it literally. Um, but actually, the, the term is coined from um, a journey. That's what it means. Mm-hmm. A zero waste shop and, zero, and being zero waste is actually like a goal. Um, and it's like the whole like journey towards that. Um, but I think because obviously a lot of people think of it literally, they'll, they think it means like no waste at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, which in this day and age, unless you grow everything and probably live in a forest that somehow isn't manned by any government or whatever, <laughs> then you're probably going to be in some kind of society that has waste. You just got to do what you can, really. Like, mm. you know, if people come here and it, oh, I needed the lemon for this recipe. So I got all my herbs and spices, but I didn't get that. I should have just went to Tesco's yeah, and yeah. got the lot. And then. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're helping nothing, you know. Yeah. Whereas if you are, yeah, maybe you have to take the hit on the lemon, but at least you've contributed something, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It's tough, isn't it? It's, I sympathise like mm. massively because trying to understand how consumer mindset works is just a mind for like watch Absolutely. all the TED talks you want. It's still yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. You obviously you've you've kind of not abandoned this place, but you you moved to Mosley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, kind of just fast forward a little story a little bit. Um, oh, sorry, was there a bit missing? You can carry on if there's... Oh, right. If there was uh, something in between. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> there was... Yeah. <laughs> she, we could be here till seven in the morning, I think honestly. I did actually send two hours great. telling someone the story. Once. Yeah, and they were a customer and they were like, right. <laughs> no, it wasn't I, a customer. But like, we're fa- I'm fascinated. Like, when I was just taking notes, I was like, oh, this could be real long because I'm so interested in all of this. Like. Okay, so when we opened, um, gosh, it was so busy that day. It was... Uh, 16th of June, 2018, yep. and we had the press here. I think the BBC were here in some capacity. Yeah, we, we and, really pushed the, the social media. Yeah, and, and, and the queues, there was like, we had to like issue like, you know, the little tickets <laughs> for people like <laughs> wait in the cafe opposite yeah. and come back because the queues were like around the corner. Like, I don't honestly think that kind of level of trade Post pandemic has ever been possible. Yeah, I don't know why, yeah. but I feel like the tray is definitely. I think um, were you surprised? Was a little pizza the oh, thought, oh, no one's going to come. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we, yeah, we've, I mean, we had a feeling quite a few people would come, but not quite that level. I think yeah. part of the reason it was so busy is is the crowdfunding. I think mm. the the number of those. I mean, there were five hundred people that backed us. I wouldn't be surprised if the vast majority of those came. Um, just to sort of see what it was going to all be about and how we would have done it. Yeah, because we um, weren't, you know, one of the first five in the UK. So mm. it was a really new new concept. I think um, people queued outside for like an hour, an hour yeah. and a half. And I remember time. in here, it was like tight and there was queues. Like this was the checkout here and there was a queue all the way. Because I remember being at the back thinking, oh my God, these people are waiting for ages. <laughs> and I don't think like, because obviously the team was new. So the scale thing was a bit slow for everyone to, to work out. I don't think it even worked, did it? Wasn't there, there a was problem, probably was some problem technical with the card error. machine? And like <laughs> we know, had to like write problems. down all the things and like only take cash. It was a nightmare. Uh, it was completely <laughs> manic. Um, but 2018 and 2019 was amazing here for the clean kilo um had a lot of support a lot of customers and a lot of people like, visiting like even there's a quite a few like more famous people as well um a few tv a few things. tv things and um, we were on um eat well for less was eat, it eat well for less sunday morning so, yes yeah, sunday morning live or yeah, saturday morning live yeah, something like that, that. Was one of the first june, june sapong came that was quite exciting um yeah it was just crazy and then we we entered this um competition on it it was like um it was small business fedex grant or something like that yeah you know we thought we'll give it a go because the prize was twenty thousand pounds and you you basically had to write in like a big essay like what you would do with with that money obviously they were looking for projects that maybe had like had um, a social aspect of it or some kind of goodness um so yeah so we we went for that and there was apparently over 15,000 applications and I just remember like on the day that it was gonna be announced like we woke up in the morning it's like all right we're checking our phones now shall we see if uh if we if we manage to win <laughs> or you know and you know what what seeing that screen i still picture it now we were like tom 
like we've won. Mm. We've won twenty thousand pounds. Yeah. Um, to open up the Bourneville store, and yeah. and so that basically, you know, we put in our um kind of essay, whatever it was, um, that we wanted to double the impact of what we've done because obviously we've saved X amount of uh, single use plastics in this premises, and we feel like if we move to another, uh, if we add to that and and you know have another premises, we would then be able to double that. And um, and how we can like push it further as well with the product range, and yes, yeah, so that was a really like surreal moment, kind of like the crowdfunding, um, where yeah, there was this like right, we're doing it, then we're opening um, Bourneville, and yeah, so that was um, we opened that in what eighth of November twenty nineteen, was it? Yeah, and yeah, that was a huge success as well. Again, like Bourneville has this great community feel, mm-hmm. like. We had volunteers come that, you know, were doing a little bit of painting and just wanted to get involved in, in what we were doing here because they believed in in the project. Um, so that so that was really great. Um, and again, 2019 was a fantastic year for Bourneville. Well, um, it was, it was you had the, them both going at the same time in 2019, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was November, December, January february and then march yes uh, i'll say year it was a few months of one but well no actually march was great for bomb film yeah. because march was a lot of things um it was like a bit of a roller coaster the march 2020 i'm talking about yeah. um yeah it was really weird um obviously we started seeing these things about covid and obviously like i don't think at the time like the supermarkets were, were like prohibiting number of customers or anything mm. but we were noticing our shops get really busy probably because of obviously like the dry food aspect as well and bulk yeah. shopping pasta and um, pasta and flour <laughs> and toilet roll i remember toilet roll you <sighs> couldn't get it could you? i think <laughs> i think someone brought oh, a gosh. pillowcase to fill with flour yeah like that's how, like that's the quantity <laughs> yeah, just like they needed a, a sack or something so yeah just yeah it was like gold just wasn't it and we were getting a little bit like this is great for business but we're a little bit worried that like too many people are coming in at the same time because obviously there's this whole virus going on that no one knows how to like stop at the minute um so we quite early on like had to make a lot of decisions like you know restrict uh, customer numbers and things like that before the um the supermarkets were doing it in fact and then um restrict obviously number of items and everything and putting your sanitizers and distancing and stuff and um it was a crazy 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 month um but yeah Bournemouth was really busy Digbeth was really busy up until the point probably when that first um lockdown hit and then that was that was it for Digbeth after that very much I think that was kind of the fall yeah. for Digbeth um because that whole year so bear in mind we used to open six long days a week in Digbeth um, and then we just didn't open at all for two months in Digbeth. Was it, was it two months completely? Which was a big Six decision weeks. for us because, like, we never really, like, close. So this was like, gosh, we're going to close. Like, what are we going to do? Is it the right thing? Like, Because when you close, ultimately people get out of habit of things and it's, like, yeah. it's that massive danger of people not coming into habit. And obviously our whole shop is about changing that behavioural habit and then we're suddenly getting people out of the habit that they've just changed to we thought it was a bit risky and then um, um, there was also the stay home and stay local so yeah. if you were going shopping you were supposed to only go to your local shop yeah. and dig bef- the reason we picked this spot as Jeanette said earlier was because it could attract people from longer distance so that always that that shut that revenue stream off and there was also the offices people were working from home and we we served the offices a lot. People would come after work and that kind of thing. So um, that all of that just yeah, stopped very suddenly. The whole area of Digbeth was just like just desolate, em- empty. Um, and the annoying thing was because we wasn't in hospitality during the lockdown period. I, I don't know what the grant amounts was or anything in terms of like when you were forced to close what what you get. But we're an essential shop, so we're actually forced to open. Um, oh, so gosh, yeah. yeah, so we end up opening three days a week um, because we needed we couldn't just close. There's nothing for us. We just paid, even though we had reduced rent and stuff. But there were still obviously bills that you can't avoid. Um, so we we open three days a week um, for probably a whole year. So that that was tough. Um, kind of doing that and obviously like it just didn't add up the maths basically in the end. Um, very soon after. All the COVID malarkey. Um, the roadwork started. Oh God! 
<laughs> we were like the... nailing the coffin. Oh, we were just like, like... Oh, asking people to drive here to come and do stuff. Yeah, That's... like yeah. Yeah. even everything, even walking even from anywhere. Walking was an issue. With you can't even public cross the... transport. Especially when they first did, you had to go all the way down the road just across the road. Yeah, yeah I remember and... somebody told me, "Can you pick me up from outside the Kerry Man?" Mm. And uh, I got as close as I could by car, and I was like walking to meet him, and I was like, "I can't." I can't walk there. Yeah. <laughs> I had to go back to come back. And it yeah. was like, what hope has anyone got by mm. now? You're giving up if you yeah. want to go to a bar. It something. was really, really manic. And I think we were really annoyed by it because, like, we're, we're totally pro, obviously, public transport and, and everything like that, clean air zone. But it's it's a timing issue. I know, obviously, these things were, were planned, like, in advance, but no one planned, obviously, the pandemic in between. Mm. So I feel like there should have been some adjustments yeah. to the planning considering this had just happened in, and particularly like Digbeth the area like there's not many residential so it really survives off um, footfall visitors and uh, people being able to get in into the area so you make it as attractive as possible but obviously the roadworks um, then was like another nail in the coffin so I think that was when we announced in August 2021 that we were really struggling and uh, we announced that on our social media posts and um, yeah, like that kind of boosted sales for a little while, but obviously you, you can't like force people to come to yeah. come to Digbeth at a time where it's not suitable for them to do that. And a lot of people were still obviously worried about COVID even yeah. um, during that time, people just wasn't going out the way they used to. And I think behavioral habits changed a lot, which was a real shame because um, obviously a lot of people did go online and something we were really proud of in, in Bourneville was being a local store to people um, that wasn't necessarily interested in zero waste, but saw us as a grocery store. So they might have just walked in, seen this fruit and veg, and then walked in and realised, oh, they don't have, like, any packaging here. I'm supposed to bring my own containers. And then they started then, you know, bringing their own containers and getting into habit. So, because Digbeth really, like, was, I would say, most interesting for people that, that, that already knew about zero waste and was already on that path. But Bourneville wasn't. Bourneville changed habits a lot um, and it was really impactive. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was a real shame that obviously the pandemic dampened a lot of that. In fact, there was an cr- increased usage of plastic during the pandemic and things like that. And um, obviously a lot of people went online. So we d- we found it tough. And even even obviously Bourneville declined a bit as well through the pandemic. Um the, per- the permits. When did the permit parking come oh, in? Gosh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, just, it was just a random addition at one point. It just seems to change. I feel like that bit it's was ridiculous. a bit just That's like, just a kick in the Yeah, box. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, all right, well, you obviously had the big roadworks plans and you had obviously had the government pushing the clean air zone. But what, why the parking permits? Like they, I feel like any other place would be like, right, once the uh, tram line's open, then we'll put the permits in because mm. it makes sense, but yeah. not burn again. We were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, let's whack them in let's there. Let's everything Just, together. Because I, I remember driving in, because it, it's still permit on a Saturday, isn't it? Mm. So I came in one six. Saturday and I went to park and I was like, can't park in it. I was going to go to Red Brick Market and I was like, I can't yeah, park. Yeah, yeah. Where am no. I going to park? So I yeah, to go I used and to pay the a lot of wine from Wine Freedom. Yeah. yeah. So I used to yeah. go there a lot for buying wine. And it's just like, how am I supposed I to do that? I think their like, argument was that because they're encouraging like less car usage, but this thing is like, it, it doesn't all work at the same time if you don't have the public transport there ready. For, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so great having the cars if you've got the tram. Yeah. You, need people on board. you need people to buy into it and come with mm. you. Yeah, and exactly. They're just not going. They're just going to get angry and be like... Yeah, and those are the three points we wrote on that post. And I would then, love to not have a car. I would love to have a really yeah. inexpensive public transport system that yeah. gets us wherever I want to go in Birmingham, but yeah. we just don't have it. No. It, it's a shame. Yeah. And yeah. going back to that point about planning as well, you can... It was planned in advance, like Jeanette said, but I don't think it was thought through that well um, Mm. because they're now saying that, yeah, they'll finish the tram works in probably two years' time, but which is but was always which is an insult in itself. <laughs> um, but then they're actually saying that the tram won't be on the tracks for another two years after that. Yeah. And that. and the the reason for that is because there is some interaction with HS2 that it has to go underneath something that has to be built with HS2 initially. But surely they could have had a conversation about that beforehand and wait two years... Yeah. to start doing the digging up of the road so that space, it was finished yeah. when it's ready to have a tram on it. Because, 
you know, you, all of these businesses around Digba, five or six of which we know have closed. We knew them personally. And you, you mentioned one of them, uh, Wine Freedom, yeah. um, Stag, Barbers, Roberto's, mm. so many great places mm. at Dig, Dig Brew. Brew yeah. Yeah. Um, like all of those businesses would have survived almost certainly if they'd left it a year or so after the pandemic to then start doing the roadworks. But it was mm. just like, no, we've got to go ahead with it. This was in the plan, so we've got to do it. But they didn't think about that the process. Small businesses, like, you know, they, they talk about how it's going to enrich the area in the future, which I agree it will, but it's like, that, might be, be another, that might be another set of people. So it wasn't mm. very yeah, <laughs> great. Big for the just won some, not one, but it was in one of the papers. It's like one the of the Times coolest, or the yeah, Telegraph, one of the coolest I think. cities, one parts of a city. Yeah. Or neighbourhood, I think it was coolest neighbourhood in the country. Yeah. And then, obviously, that would have brought people here. Mm. And then people get here, like, how oh, the fuck do I get around anything? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And did us- you have any com- uh, conversations with the council and stuff? Or lots? Yeah. Well, we we did. So at the at the time, so this August twenty twenty one, when we were realised just how bad it was here, we were actually one of the first businesses to be vocal about it. I think because it was right on our doorstep, and um, we were we were on the high street. Um, and we noticed the trade just drop off. And, um, you know, we wrote letters to MPs, Andy Street, um, everyone really, Ian Ward. Um, it was just very, like, I, feel, I don't know, there was like this, oh, yeah, like, well, you know, we had, a, we had a direct contact with someone in Andy Street's office who had phone calls with me and was like, oh, we'll do X, Y, and Z to help you. And then none of it really actually, like, materialised. I, I don't know where that went. Um and then there was a very generic letter from the council, like when we asked about things like, you know, is there any plans to reduce plastic in, in Birmingham? Because I think what could have been done with, you know, not not like um, just you know, save the clean kilo, but I think because the pandemic shadowed the whole plastic pollution so much that there needed to be much more of a push of plastic pollution on the agenda onto the press as well because a lot of people obviously was talking about it in 2018 2019 but then it just all stopped and I feel like if there was more like um council awareness campaign and things like that that would still obviously you don't have to label come to the clean kilo but it would just you know put on people's agenda and and to be honest you know we we obviously if you if you have less waste there is less bins being collected that will save council money so maybe they could just think of it like that but yeah so but there there just really wasn't um anything that came back uh, of like significant help there was a few councillors don't get me wrong that um do shop with us that were were more helpful than others but yeah there was nothing that could be done like dramatically like you know if they were to say you're a green business so here's his uh, funding for you guys, like that would have been great. That would have sorted out loads of problems. But they were, they were like, you know, there's no money in the pot. This is what it is, kind of thing. And um, that's when we really had to reevaluate um, what we were doing here as a zero waste shop in in Digbeth. Was it actually going to to work? Um, obviously, there were all these bills still coming out and things. So that's when we made a decision that we would actually like try and move because we wasn't ready just to like give up on like this was the flagship store and obviously had all these people crowdfunding so we didn't want to just give up back then it just didn't feel right we wanted to give it another go and we felt like if we moved to a suburb that was more similar to Bourneville setup where people could walk on foot then obviously maybe there'll be some kind of improvement in in accessibility which obviously is really key because people do you know go for convenience so it needs to be accessible and then obviously we didn't want to give up on this premises and we were just like looking in the area like you know what most of Digbiff is hospitality we came out of the pandemic where people were looking for experiences so obviously you know like sitting outside uh, was a big thing and and um having coffee and stuff and we'd already introduced an element of that to the clean kilo at that point so we did have a uh, tables and chairs outside and we tried to do um coffee but it because it was never planned for that it just meant logistically it was really hard for the mm. staff to actually like they will go and try and get coffee from one of the rooms over there and then get the cups from here and then use a little grinder from <laughs> over there and like logistically they were just like please Jeanette can we just not do this <laughs> coffee thing because it's like not logistically set up for this so we started thinking oh maybe we could actually do like a zero waste cafe bar because one of the other things that we were still going to the supermarket for was wine 
Mm. And we're like, there must be like some kind of better option than this. And then this, I think it was an email came through one day. So this was during, so this is going back a little bit, but it was like during the lockdown and it was like a, a zero waste wine tasting session from um, these artisan uh, wines that were coming in refillable stainless steel kegs. And we're like, yes, this is <laughs> this is what we want. Um, mm. But yeah, we joined up to it and um, they were basically um, aiming at um, doing this refillable keg and um, wine dispensing system for zero waste shops. And we thought about introducing it uh, in, into the shop at the time but to get an alcohol license to sell like two or three wines wouldn't have been like viable really and um, and a lot a lot of work so um, I think we that's when we um sort of put start, it on the back yeah. burner thought thought that it'd be something to do maybe in the future but um mm. Tim is our uh, local beekeeper I don't know if you heard of B9 yeah, 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 yeah. Up, up on top of the uh, custom factory yeah, yeah up on the roof there so we from day one of clean kilo we've sold his honey mm. um either loose or in jars so um you there was like a stainless steel fusty that you could put your jar below and fill it with the honey not so great in winter because it always crystallized and <laughs> you'd open the tap and nothing came out but, but yeah he's he's also got hives in um worcestershire and um his the bees from his hives were pollinating, was it a disused yeah. orchard, apple orchard? Um, and these apples were just going on the floor and rotting. So he had uh, conversations with the farmer and they ended up being, having an uh, agreement where he could take the apples and he used those apples to make cider and juices. Um, initially it was just cider and he, he came to us with this cider. We didn't have the personal license yet um or the premises license mm. yeah we were well excited to sell it we yeah, used well, yeah, it, it was for, amazing it was so nice it was, it was like delicious it. and we used it for halloween like um what was it like an event it was the like a halloween cider. event i don't know if you remember it you dig, remember dig fest it dig was like yeah, october it, yeah. 2021 so that's when we applied for the temporary license and uh, so yeah so there were these like pockets of things coming in that like we thought, oh yeah, we've got like circular wine. We've got a local producer who's making local alcohol, like obviously from these disused apples, obviously like local apples. Um, you know, can we're already in, we've already got things like um, circular coffee beans from a local mm. roaster. So crisps for snacks. Crisps. Yeah. So it, it was falling it, into. Place. It was all kind yeah. of falling <laughs> into place. We didn't probably have the confidence to do it our, ourselves. So. We were going to like go in with someone basically, but that never materialized. So we were kind of like, oh, right, do we, because this was on the, bear in mind, I don't know if you know about the COVID recovery grant. It was something that was offered to businesses after the um, the pandemic. Uh, so I think it was a very, it was actually, it was a very like open grant, wasn't it? So like. Yeah, anyone could apply. It was, it was government run. It was yeah. government money, like uh, national government, but it was uh, administrated by Birmingham City Council. So. Yeah, the money was divvied it. out to different yeah. councils and then you apply. Yeah, and one of the things you could do, obviously, was diversify your business. And, you know, they were a lot of people were doing that at the time because, like, shops were coming into cafes and things like that. Everything yeah. changed. And um, so, obviously, we put our plan together uh, for this Zero Waste Cafe bar and uh, got the funding through. But then, obviously, um, we were like, do we continue with it ourselves? Because... We don't have any experience in hospitality. We we know our concepts. We know what we want, um, and we know how to source. Like that's what we've been doing for for the clean kilo. Um, but do we know how to like run and design and manage a bar? And but yeah, I don't know. I think we had a lot of energy, didn't we? <laughs> I don't know how. I, don't <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know how. I, I'm knackered, honestly. Um, so I think in 2021, yeah, you, you, you had to spend it within three months yeah. of like being uh, being told you'd got it. Know, it was yeah. hectic, really. Like um, trying to spend that kind of money in 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 a short period of time. You and, think it's like a really nice thing, but actually, when you have to document and explain every every receipt, it's actually yeah. quite like an admin. It's a role on its own, really. Yeah. We basically, you know, found another premises, obviously, for the Clean Kilo and was obviously doing all the background things that that required at the time. Whilst this was all happened very quickly. So we didn't start planning Kilo Zero really till um, end of December 2021. It's kind of literally start of 2022. Yeah. The whole business concept and building it, constructing it happened within months at the same time we moved 
to Mosley. And I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> so it's, how did you find time to do that? We, we, we honestly just didn't. You don't have a break. At one That's point, I think way. it was... <laughs> I think it was Boxing Day and it was then uh, a day in like April and that was like the first half a morning off we had or something like ridiculous. So you had Boxing Day off. We had Boxing Day off and then we all just like boom, 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 Didn't boom, stop boom. again until wow. April. Uh, until April. And it was, yeah, it was complete madness because obviously we had to take, because obviously the, the, the lease took a, a long time to come through in Mosley and then it had to be a quick announcement on social media. We only gave like a week notice. It was yeah. all very quick and then we pretty much moved everything well no we couldn't move everything we had to do some stuff with Bourneville first the premises to make it good um, I don't know oh yeah mostly yes. um, to, to make it good it gets confusing <laughs> and then obviously pack up everything here and then we we moved it all and somehow opened within like three weeks yeah. is there no part where you were thinking that this is just too much hard work why don't we just cut our lasses with Digbeth and fuck it move on to Mosley and Bourneville yeah. The idea of that crossed our minds, but it's the idea of moving all of this stuff into storage because you can't just go, right, let's sell it or, or yeah. whatever. We can just move to that to Mosley and not do the bar all together. But I feel like... We'd got the we had really, funding come yeah, through. Yeah, we and, obviously didn't need to use the funding, but I feel like we'd had hit on a really good concept because it's kind of like the excitement we felt when mm. we started the Clean Kilo supermarket. We're like, yeah, this could like... You know, we could like reduce like look, all this packaging and talk to all these local people, and that's create obviously, something really unique. Yeah, as well. create something really unique, and and I guess that's what what Kilo Zero was because we wanted to again do what we did, but in the hospitality industry. So we wanted to contact loads of local distilleries, local cider makers, craft beer and cider, um, and then get those in like stainless steel kegs. Um, obviously, we we already had a lot of the supplies in terms of snacks and stuff already had those and then obviously we had this amazing like wine that like was really like high quality wine but obviously in this uh, circular keg that saves 96 percent of the carbon footprint because of the um energy it would take to obviously make the glass and then the carbon associated with transporting heavy glass and um heavy liquid and then obviously even recycling glass um would have a footprint and, and an energy consumption so it was kind of like wow, we've never really thought about the hospitality industry, about reducing waste, same as when we hadn't thought about the grocery industry. It was just this, like, crazy concept. That we're like, yeah, yeah, like, like let's, let's do this. And it just felt right. And we wanted to make that impact that we had with, obviously, the grocery side of things here. So, yeah, we just, like, kind of carried on, I don't know, mm. in a frenzy of work. And, uh, yeah, this whole place was, um, there was a lot of work that had to be done because it was everything from, like, Electrics. The... And- Plumbing. Yeah, because we try to do everything ourselves, basically. Like, suddenly my menswear clothing background then became, like, interior design and <laughs> yeah. commercial bar design, which is something I'm really interested in now and maybe I could like to pursue in the future, actually. And then Tom, from his experience doing setting up the clean kilo shops, so obviously you've probably noticed the, there's a lot of, like, upcycled wood and that's mm. where your carpentry mm. skills started to, to develop. Like, we kind of somehow designed the bar obviously did all the plumbing stuff all the electrics that had to be done obviously getting like the water into this bar area here like the checkout used to be here so this was just kind of those rooms didn't have any water running through it so there was a oh, was it loads of youtube videos or yeah, well, pretty much. i mean electrics we got yeah obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> didn't, didn't try messing around with that no yeah but in terms of like design it was very much like pinterest i like these images um, calling upon a few friends that like know the industry better, being like, you know, how how wide does the bar need to be to make it like usable, and um, yeah. where do things need to be positioned to make it like um, accessible? And yeah, I like- remember um, when the when Hundred House came, and I was like, I don't want the grinder next to the coffee machine because I want more bar showing, and they're like, no, you have to have the coffee grinder next to the the coffee machine. And, and why like, should be walking off for and I was like, no, like five I just minutes want it, you know, to go and get I was like, I just want it just like behind. Like, it must be a quick, quick movement, won't it? Just a quick movement behind. And they're like, no, no, no. It's got to be next to it. And I was like, all right, then I gave in. But now, like, obviously understand like the usability. And it was a steep learning curve. Even the kind of like the beer lines and the, the taps, obviously we have a lot of them, um, like, because we're using the tap system, we're having a lot of kegs 
like how that works in terms of like the seller. I'll show you later in the vault. Oh, yeah, that you've was got like... beer and wine kegs. So you've got yeah, a lot of yeah. Kegs going two on. different systems, two different yeah, gases. And, yeah, and... that was a lot of googling, and um, we needed the wine system. Obviously, we've got this like lovely tap wall here, which is all fancy, and because we wanted people to be able to like self serve like they do at the clean kilo, and mm. um, but obviously now in the wine format that. Obviously, when you're dispensing cleaning products, if you overspill a little bit, it's also a cleaning product. Yeah. You can't really like overflow <laughs> wine and stuff. So we needed something more technical that was going to like do measurements and things like that. Um, and that's where obviously the research into the, the tap system came into it. I don't even know how, but we managed to design and build the bar kind of in like, was it three months in the end? Mm. And that was including the whole of the business plan, like as in, I remember the the day after Boxing Day, I applied for the personal license and the and then went into premises license. So it was kind of really from scratch, the whole concept. And was, there was loads of stuff as well. I had to apply for planning permission to change yeah. the use yeah. and that yeah. kind of thing. There's, there's so much that so went much into it that, about, that yeah. you don't even see here as well. Yeah. Like, and then um, the sourcing was obviously like the fun bit. So like um, we've got a couple of display walls here which actually work we actually are a bottle shop as well so you can buy the spirits is that is the idea but we don't really promote it I don't know why but yeah so on one side it says supporting local and, and independent and like we try to contact local distilleries to see um you know if they could supply in, in bulk like the way we did with the crisps basically see if they could do circular with any of them and a lot of them will actually take back the glassware. So you've got like mm. Henstone, which is in Shropshire, Thousand Cherries is Birmingham, and we've got Litchfield Fist Bar, which is literally Tom's friend in Litchfield, um, Half Penny Cider. I don't know if you've come across those guys. You might see them at like um, the Mosley Farmers Market or the other one, um, Kings Norton Farmers Market. It's so, yeah, like Burning Barn. I think they're based on like Sally Hall or. Yeah, um, yeah, Sally, yeah, yeah. Friends yeah. are good at yeah. Really good stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, like, and it was great to like obviously get all these independents on board because sometimes like they might not get showcased because they're such like big companies that will kind of like give stock to a bar or something to like obviously so they like utilize just their yeah. stock uh, but we we didn't want any of that we just wanted to pick the brands we wanted to pick and uh, so we contacted them and directly most of them um, and then on the other side of the wall here when obviously you couldn't get some of the spirits locally. We looked at the brands that had a sustainable ethos about them, which is why we came across things like Cooper King, which is a carbon negative gin, and Two Drifters, a carbon negative rum. Discarded, you've probably heard of. Um, yeah. They're a bigger brand, so they use like discarded banana peels, etc., to make their rum. And then we came across um, Sustainable Spirit, which... Um, they do our house serves basically and they come in eco pouches so it's a five liter pouch that we save and then we actually send back and it gets refilled and then we well, we started the conversation with a lot of these kind of distilleries a lot of them were open to doing a five liter jerry can again that we can send back and get refilled so I think I was quite surprising actually like that we didn't know the drinks industry like kind of already had pockets of like a circular system and mm. um, so that was really good to find out. So when we found out, you know, we could, a lot of these spirits could be actually circular. Obviously that was really good. Um, local craft beer and cider was, was easy yeah. in, in the West Midlands. And yeah, like pretty much everything we already had. The thing, the, men, the menu that develops the most was the cocktail menu. The, the very first cocktail menu was, was basically classics. And um, it was like, for instance, espresso martini, it's um, a shot, a double shot of the obviously locally roasted coffee, the 100 house. Um, and then we we wanted to use things that obviously had a more sustainable ethos. So we used a coffee, uh, fair trade coffee liqueur. We made our own homemade sugar syrup. And yeah, obviously even the vodka in it was um, it was circular basically. Mm. So it didn't have single use um, packaging attached to it. And so so basically each of these classics, like we explain like what that um, kind of the eco side of it was. But then for the, the next menu... It just started really with Tom's mum. <laughs> yeah, she, she gave us an article that she'd found in uh, the Times, maybe. I think the, the newspaper she was reading at the time. And uh, it was it showed us that vegetables and fruit were like the new thing, the, the sort of trending, trending thing to, to put in cocktails mm. and make, make cocktails out yeah. of from scratch. So That was exciting for me because... Well, Jeanette's obsessed with I'm grace. Obsessed. I think you can probably tell that by now. Um, yeah, so basically what we normally do as a couple 
is we take all these like overripe fruit and veg from the clean kilo and we just have a lot of boiled vegetables <laughs> and Tom hates it basically. Um, old broccoli. Old broccoli. Mm, all, all, all the, the customers <laughs> won't buy. It's like, right, that's ours. That's dinner. Yeah, we don't, we don't <laughs> ever take <laughs> the new stock basically. We always take things that are off or old or something. And I was like, I've got loads of fruit and veg. <laughs> This is great that it's trending. So let's take the overripe surplus fruit and veg from the clean kilo and mix it into our cocktail drinks. And obviously, um, we're lucky to have a great team that obviously have creativity and experience in obviously cocktail making, obviously, because our experience isn't in that. So when we were doing our recruitment, we obviously wanted to make sure that any areas that we were lacking in, we would have someone that obviously was a cocktail mixologist, et cetera, things like that. So when we... We would give the brief basically like, guys, like, broccoli's on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, carrots. Carrots. Also, yeah, I think the broccoli was the one that, that got left at the end and then the the newest, the no, it was the newest girl that joined mm. had to make the broccoli, <laughs> which was the brocktail. So she got the short straw, but she made a great drink and uh, even um, Birmingham Cocktail Week and they, they talked about the brocktail. There was always um, like a warning next to that one on the menu. Yes. Like, I only pick this if you're adventurous, you know. <laughs> and like broccoli. Really like broccoli. Tom don't like broccoli. Didn't, so you never recommended it. it to anyone. I was like, no. I always, he's like, can you start recommending to people? I was like, well, it's a good drink. <laughs> yeah, we got really creative with the menu because we obviously were using these vegetables and like, so there was like infusions or fat washing, like different techniques that basically would prolong the life and obviously by adding the alcohol in. Roasting carrots in honey and yeah. and then blending it and mixing yeah. it. With- so definitely a lot of like um, time and, and thought go, goes into um, the cocktail menu particularly. And um, the... The menu after that was um, the way snack menu, and that came from um, I think it was co- coming towards Halloween, and Halloween was always like a oh should we stock pumpkins at the clean kilo because like especially with all these kids in Bourneville they'll love the pumpkins, but then there's always that side of what happens to all the pumpkin flesh, mm. and it kind of was always like a, a bugbear of mine where I didn't want to sell the pumpkins because I didn't think the flesh was going to go to a good place. <laughs> yeah, <the bin. laughs> it was just going to go to the bin. So, um, yeah, we never have sold carving pumpkins at, at the shops before. Um, so for this cocktail menu, thought, right, well, there's loads of people that buy pumpkins. They don't even carve it sometimes. Um, maybe we should collaborate with other businesses and say, you know, we we'll give you an X amount of like cocktail vouchers or whatever or some promos adding your name to our menu if you can donate um, some pumpkins to us for our waste nut pumpkin cocktail. And yeah, so it was great. Obviously, we had, we had the Crown um, who donates loads of pumpkins as well and obviously like a few businesses around here. And that's where that uh, menu started. So we started like talking to other businesses about collabs of what waste that they have. Um, so there was like uh, Billy from Organic Farm. We've used him like seasonally um, for fruit and veg. He's at the Mosley Farmers Market as well. And he had these like overripe damsons. So obviously no one's going to buy it as they are. So um, we bought them from him and obviously made our damson cocktail. And then I think for like the next menu, we would like to like see what other waste is out there to see how we can incorporate that in, into drinks. And yeah. So has been asking for a potato cocktail for quite a while Yeah. Now, but but they all look at us pretty strangely when we're That's tired. the thing. Like <laughs> a change. Yeah, yeah. 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 Irish uh, whiskey, do you used to make it out of potatoes? Sometimes get a bit of pushback, like, oh, this will never work. And you're like, well, why not? Well, if you made a broccoli cocktail taste, all right, you, can you, do might, anything, you definitely got to be, yeah. there must be anything you can make taste good. How does it work? Do you have to push back a lot, Tom, or? <laughs> <laughs> Or do you yeah. just do you have an inst- you must have an instinct now just to say this it's, one's not too bad, I'll let this one go. Or it's you not just, just like, me. everyone it's, in free. It, it's the rest of the team as well. Yeah. Like, oh, like, this is too much Here we go again. Well, I want to do a, a, a beer cocktail, Fantastic, strawberry beer though. cocktail. Basically, yeah, as you've probably talked to many bars and pubs before, the first pull that comes out of the line gets wasted yeah. and that I can't handle it, basically. <laughs> and, and I need to think of some way to make that into some kind of cocktail and preserve its life a little bit. Having, um, having wine on draft as well means that you've got it with wine as well. So, But we already use the wine for, for the, wine-based cocktails. Yeah, so we got a cocktail um, called Stop Whining About Waste. And those are wine-based cocktails from the first pull on the line. 
but just like n- no one's on board with doing this beer one. <laughs> beer I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, if I have time, that's the thing. I'm obviously, I want to be able to just develop it, but it's kind of trying to run the businesses at the same time. There's a lot of elements. So it's kind of like, oh, I can't do everything. So when um, you opened this, you decided you were going to be based here all the time? No, that just happened. Mm. That we we live closer to here, to be fair, yeah. so that kind of made sense. Um, and we already had the office here. I think with it being a new business, it, it requires just needed a lot more our time. Anyway. Yeah. How did you let go of the other two stores then? Yeah, I think it was already kind of in a good process because yeah. process is already there. I mean, we've got Voita, who's a who's a great supervisor manager. He's he's the sort of general manager now of the two shops, and he's yeah. he's great. He's yeah. Um, I think we're like well, how many years are we in now? Five years into the Queen Kilo, right? At least, and Voita had been with us for four years. So yeah, um, and um, I guess the system's already set up, um, and so long as you got someone good in place to to manage the rest of the team, it it will just run. Whereas I feel like. The reason we had to work on the bar more was because we were still finding our feet. A lot, obviously, mm. doing all this um, menu development and um, sourcing and then changing the model a little bit, like I mentioned, um, when we realised. Because I think the first few months we didn't have any private hire and we found it a little bit tough, even though it was summer. And then we're like, right, well, maybe we need to like rethink that and just think of this as a space where we can provide, obviously, all these local spirits, uh, zero waste cocktail local craft beers but obviously when you do private hire people are going to come because it's someone's birthday that they've been invited to and things like that and you know we don't want to do it long term don't get me wrong because we don't want to annoy the regulars that just want to come here and have a drink and then we'll all mm. close but it's that balance where if we don't do it then we may not have great um, customers that night in terms of footfall and then obviously then it puts us in difficulty but obviously if we do it too often we don't want to like depend on it so it's trying to find a balance at the moment we're trying to like avoid it on like like Saturdays for instance yeah. um, where people will just be walking past yeah the whole thing is just like quite a steep learning curve and a, it's been an exciting process but it's been a lot of hard work Blood, yeah. sweat and tears, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> How quick did you fall in love with hospitality? Um, I don't know if I'm in love. I'm not going to lie. You, you talk <laughs> like someone who's in love with hospitality. You've got like, I, that passion. And... I have passion, definitely. I'm not going to lie. I haven't, I haven't not found it hard. Um, coming into a, a new industry the way we did. Um, it's quite similar to retail, though. Uh, it's, was, people, it's all people, isn't it, really? Because the service you know? wasn't... Um, the issue, I guess, it was kind of the the menu creations and the constant. I guess with the clean killer, because we'd already sourced everything, we occasionally add new things. Whereas I find in hospitality, things change a lot. Mm. Menus change. Obviously, we're doing the booking thing, so each booking is a a new thing that I have to work on. And we've taken some big bookings where we've even hired next door, and there's like. 100 people, and they wanted corporate catering wow. from. Wow. Um, you know, it was like very much like, yeah, we want coffee at nine and then we want like snacks at 9.30 and then there was like this whole day so suddenly I've become an, an events planner and I hadn't planned for that I guess um when when you're short staffed because we're trying to obviously manage the budget a little bit where we don't want to overstaff it because we somehow get these like days where some Friday nights could be really quiet here and then obviously um if we lose business like long term and lose money long term it's not gonna be viable so then um we I feel like we ha- were around a lot Um, in terms of like being on the floor as well so to do that and own and run the business in terms of the admin side of one business but then also run the other business and we do our own social media as well so I basically up until probably a few months ago I've always done every single post you've seen like it would have been me that wrote it now I've got an apprentice that's helping me but obviously that's still a lot of guidance from me even managing someone to do that role um so anything graphic based is all us I think it's just because of the the size of the team really as small business nature you're literally doing everything and because I think we're doing two sides of the business um during what is a cost of living crisis so you've got to try extra hard Mm. and especially with the roadworks as well it's I think um, one of the things, I think Jeanette is saying it as well, is that with a shop, it, if you like a particular food shop, you're going to go there either every week regularly or every couple of weeks or every month. But with a bar, there's so many other bars that 
someone could go, right, let's go to city centre this time. Let's go to Digbeth. Let's go to Broad Street. Mm. So and it's this, it fluctuates so, so much. So that's why you can't plan so much for staff. Yeah. Um, so like one, like you were saying, one day, one Friday, it could be really dead. And the next Friday you go, right, well, let's put less staff on. Let's, and then all of a sudden <laughs> it's really busy and you're thinking, like, yeah. how how can you, you can't predict that. I think the that's one of the... laws dis- of hospitality, that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Where, whereas with retail, I think you can kind of, you've got a good idea. It's pretty much stays the same. Yeah. You know, for longer periods, maybe it changes, but... Yeah, and people, I guess you say, like, they come back often because they need a food item. Whereas these days it's like people going out and this might be their one outing that month um, because of the cost of living crisis and yeah so it's definitely tough out there like things that I've enjoyed like I definitely enjoy the customer interaction and like talking to people because I feel like we never she's did... obviously good at talking <laughs> yeah. we, we can tell <laughs> yeah there were some customers came in and I was like have you heard of the clean kilo and they're like no like, and then like Tom rolled his eyes and thought oh god she's she's gonna talk about the clean kilo it's important you gotta share your story people don't yeah. like Buy the products or services, they they buy stories. Yeah. They? But after 15 minutes, this lady was like, I didn't know there was so much to know about a bar. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can yeah. tell you more. <laughs> can, I, can I get that coffee? Now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's definitely like, and I, yeah, obviously the creativity in, in what we're doing is exciting. Um, but yeah, I would like more normality. Like, I, I don't think as the clean kilo... Well, certain periods of the time of clean clothes, we didn't always work seven days a week. Mm. Whereas I feel like we now. always work seven days a week <laughs> and later hours than before. Because mm. obviously the shop would close at half five. But now we're like, oh, it was just like before we go, like, make, let's make sure they're all right before we go. And it's like, oh, it's half nine, ten o'clock. Oh, like, <laughs> and the only thing that makes <laughs> us stop working is the fact that the Zelig building closes at 9.30 and you have to leave. Whereas it used to open to what, 10, 10.30, 10 11. 11. Yeah, it was ridiculous that we'd stay that late because it was open that late. Mm. I remember and now you get kicked out, you've got to go. I remember once actually someone did, when we were the Clean Kilo, um, someone wrote on a Facebook message to us, a customer, I was really disappointed that your lights were open at one in the morning. I thought you were an eco place and you would, you know, be mindful to switch off your lights. And we're like, well, the reason lights are on is because we're still working. Like, <laughs> 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 like, yeah. So yeah, I don't think people really understand what it is sometimes to be a small business owner. I'm enjoying it, but obviously it comes with yeah. a lot of it, giving it all, basically. So mm. there's a restaurant next. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, we have been dabbling into food. Don't get us started. Oh, if we had the space. <laughs> Come on, restaurant, please. <laughs> if we had the space, like, yeah, zero waste restaurant for sure um but yeah we're just gonna do collabs for now <laughs> cool good collab scene at the minute in birmingham yeah, do you have any weird. like tips or advice you could give to hospitality businesses who want to become a bit more sustainable yeah i think like i think there's already so much out there that like and it's just about changing that habit and you know looking like you know there might be a wholesaler or something that has multiple products but sometimes if you go direct to the distillery, they might be able to do something different in terms of the circular aspect mm. as well. And to be honest, there is um, there's an advantage in terms of pricing as well, um, in terms of buying bulk. I mean, and with less like glass packaging. I don't know how much these glass bottles are, but I can imagine they're pretty expensive. Mm. So you, that's actually the good thing as well. Like you will save some money, and um, so that could be an incentive to to, to do that. Um, and yeah, just really consider like obviously like any revenue of waste that's happening in your premises could be reduced or utilized in some way yeah it's mm-hmm. having the energy though like in the time yeah. And, but yeah, they yeah. Need, it needs to change it's it's just not enough now to say oh well that's make an excuse let's make an excuse and move on it, it's mm. not it's not acceptable yeah. anymore yeah. i think like it's it's inevitable there's going to be more push on plastic, obviously, since, you know, the last few years, there was obviously the plastic straw. This year is going to be plastic plates and cutlery in terms mm. of the ban. Mm. Um, so you might as well start now to kind of future proof your business to make sure you're in line with everything. And um, because the change is, is going to happen, it might be slower than anticipated, but like it will happen. And I think like, um, even if, environmental isn't like the number one concern i think there is obviously financial benefits and obviously there's the necessity of it as well um and 
once you get used to it, you you don't notice it as much. Like mm. I don't know, maybe we just do things really long, but I honestly don't really notice <laughs> like some the extra it's process. Not near, like the circular stuff. I remember when I first started working in bars. I remember having to keep the mixer bottles, the Britvic uh, mixer bottles. Yeah, and you go out the back, and there was pallets, like crates upon Stacked crates up. of them, waiting for somebody to come and collect them. Yeah. Or Nuki Brown, always. Yeah, to Nuki Brown them. as well. Yeah, that yeah. was when I like first started that was a good few years ago now. Yeah, yeah yeah i don't i don't, I don't know if they still take those back the new no it's so everything's honestly yeah. everything's in them blue big blue bins that yeah, they keep yeah. under the bar and you just whack everything in there the noisy Glass, bins. plastic yeah. metal everything goes in there it might in fairness you know what i'm saying this but it's been 10 years since i've worked in yeah. hospitality so it may have changed but yeah. like i worked at river spoons and mb and i doubt it's changed that much nah. you know? not there yeah i think the, the, the big maybe. chains definitely going to take a while but i think small businesses a lot of them are already probably doing things now hopefully so. independents are a bit more open to it you know? yeah yeah definitely like we've spoken to quite a few bar people and they're like yeah yeah we've got this and that and you know it, it exists now the, mm. so it's not as hard to, to, to do it as it used to be was there anything else you wanted to to bring up <laughs> forever hold your peace <laughs> uh, there is something i want to bring up basically we mention us at the start we were supposed to be collabing with something so what we're looking for right now is actually someone to work with as an operator that understands the industry and has that expertise so like somebody is in to come and work for you to organize these events like not work, work for us i mean more like with yeah like mm. a like you know somebody's got part, a bit of experience in yeah it. be a, a big part of the business and you know we, we're starting to talk to a, a few people but obviously like we want someone to come from experience the experience that we're lacking obviously we've got the ethos and everything behind us but um but someone to obviously that needs to share the ethos of wanting to do this um but might just know industry better and it could be like um a bigger bigger part of business i don't mean just work for us i mean like a proper like joint venture kind of thing but yeah no but other than that um i think we've we've covered the whole whole journey right mm, pretty much that was brilliant. Absolutely loved it. I don't know if you listen, but just a nice way to finish the podcast. Carl just has a few, just, just general few fun happy questions. questions. What's your favourite TV show? Yeah, we nothing, do, nothing we, do, we do watch. We do, we watch, do watch TV. TV. Tom forces us. Yeah, like <laughs> to relax. It'll be it'll be like fifteen <laughs> minutes before bed just to kind of take our minds off stuff. So we'll, like, it'll take us four nights to watch an episode, for example. Yeah. Oh, well, for me, it would probably have to be Sopranos or something like that. Yeah, but, that's a good one. But as a couple, I don't know. I honestly, I've got mine blank. I can think about work and years of history <laughs> and back to 2018 and whatever. TV's but I can't think about It only TV. takes up a tiny bit of Yeah, the, I, don't, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your favourite movie? Also difficult. Zero Dark Thirty, that's quite a good one. Yeah, like, I, like, I quite like the army ones and stuff. Yeah, we have genres that we like to go to. Mm. We like we true, like true, true story, true story type ones. Is yeah, because we find them educational. I guess so. <laughs> that's for me anyway. I feel like I'm learning something. What's your favourite yeah. band or artist? Because you must listen to music while you work as well, I presume. Um, I you can like, have, I like old, I like older stuff like Led Zeppelin. I guess would be yeah, like, yeah that's a good probably answer. up there. That's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just have weird stuff. I think I only re- remember music from the nineties. Like Britney Spears or yeah. Yeah. That's all I can Christina remember. Aguilera. I think I, once, I went, I, once I hit like work mode, I think I feel like. But I generally, as a genre, I like folk music. I mm. go for that. Nice. <laughs> What's your favourite big fast food chain? Now I really don't have one of those. You don't like? Do you know, doesn't like fast food. Um, I was gonna, that'd be so un. <laughs> not, if you were like, yeah, if you were like, yeah, McDonald's, that'd be so not right. <laughs> Just ruin their brand. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, just like even if it wasn't the ethos I think like the actual quality is really poor and for what yeah. you get for yeah. your money I think we enjoy mm-hmm. going to like the independents yeah. you know and it doesn't not going to be fast but yeah. that's I think that's what we're like you say it's not what we're about yeah. um, I think the nearest thing to like a burger currently we would say with life is somewhere like Handel right? yeah like, they do know. a really good yeah. burger yeah, and loaded good. fries but yeah like I think yeah, even before we were we had we had our own shops and stuff. Like we were really big on like going to independence, like loving like the IB card and stuff. This was before we had our own businesses. Um, mm. So yeah, so that's kind of what we stick to. Nice. Do you have a favourite dish that you cook at home? I do. Oh, broccoli. 
<laughs> Tom hates my broccoli, but overboiled um, broccoli. The, the carbonara. Yeah, I, I make quite yeah. a good carbonara. What's your favourite food destination in the world other than Birmingham? It takes you mean a bit like of just general cuisine type? You're just going to a city to eat. Oh, What's the best one you could pick other than Birmingham? Australia must have been pretty good. Oh, I yeah, know. I, it was. It was pretty good. I don't know though. I, Birmingham's better than Australia. No, well, yeah, I think there's a lot more kind of small independents here that are like cool and unique, and yeah. I would say Hong Kong. That's something I probably do know. There mm. is like I've, I've not been yet. Some crazy hectic like eateries in Hong Kong. It's open at all hours. You just walk down, yeah, and it's like eleven o'clock at night, and it's just booming, and yeah. That sounds perfect. <laughs> kind of, you just walk in and say, "Whatever they're having, just give me that." Yeah, yeah. It's always it's always crazy and bustling in Hong Kong. But I've not been for a long time. But that's, I was born there, but I never grew up there. So um, yeah, I've been back to visit. It's a good answer, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Um, we could, I could still chat for ages, but <laughs> another time. <laughs> thank you very much. No, we did tell you it's going to be a long podcast. <laughs>